Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the legislature is deadlocked over budget concerns between the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. A major ruling today from the U.S. Supreme Court over campaign finance laws, and we'll discuss the troubled legacy of Charles Keating Jr., who died Monday night at the age of 90. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The State House and Senate continue to fight over a budget plan. This as the governor threatens to veto any bill sent to her desk before she gets a budget. Here with more in our weekly political update is Luigi Del Puerto of the Arizona Capital Times. Luigi, good to see you here. Sounds like things have uh, kind of uh, hit the wall there at the Capitol. What's going on? Things are crawling at this point. Well, not even crawling. They're not really going anywhere. The governor said yesterday they basically told legislators yesterday, don't send me anything un until we've completed the budget. And both the Speaker and the Senate President, yes, we get you, Governor. We're not sending you anything until, until this budget is completed. Now, this budget can't be completed, though, until the House and the Senate can agree. Right now, they don't agree, do they? Well, it won't be completed until the House, the Senate, and the Governor's Office can agree on the budget. It's always those three branches having to come together and decide what they want in this proposal. Now, in terms of numbers, they're not very far apart, just a couple million dollars um, separate the, the, uh, you know, the Senate budget from the House budget. However, there are crucial policy decisions within the Senate budget that, um, rather, let me backtrack a bit. There are a couple of policy decisions that the governor and the House want that's not in the Senate budget. And that's why we're seeing this a new, kind of unusual uh, dance, if you will. So what, what are those policy decisions? Well, for example, the governor is wanting full funding uh, in, in, in that new agency that she wants to be created to deal with child welfare. Uh, for, in addition to that, the, uh, the governor also wants a lot more money for the universities. Uh, the Senate budget cuts um, some of that amount. And also, um, there's the issue of charter school conversion. Mm -hmm. The governor wants to see more funding for it also. The Senate actually have the cut in half the, uh, the funding that was pr provided to them in the House budget. I was going to say, the budget itself, the, just that money for that one-year reprieve was, was $33 million, which was contested somewhat. They've cut that in half as well. I mean, is that, is, was that done uh, by necessity? Was that done for other reasons? What's going on there? Well, c clearly, Senate, Andy Biggs, Senate President Andy Biggs does not think that it's right for the charters to be creating, I'm sorry, it's right for the districts to be creating these charters. So to him, there's some ideological, philosophical objection to that. And what he wants to do is not only cut that budget in half, but also eliminate that budget for the, for the next years. What about the $900,000 that uh, John Kavanaugh wanted to give to private prisons? Is that gone for good or just gone for now? Well, right now, it, everything really is in flux. So we don't know if that comes back. Uh, you know, yet today he, he, he refused to concur in the changes that the Senate has made. So what happens next is that um, the Senate and the House will have to pick essentially three people on both ends and to come together and, you know, and hammer out a budget deal. And, and we're presuming that Kavanaugh would probably be somewhere there because he was the sponsor of the House bills. Yeah. OK, so we've got we, the House wanting this, uh, the Senate wanting that. Um, is there any, I, I know what you're going to say here, but is there any opportunity that Democrats, who are just not players in this at all, could they become players? Or is this still a Republican issue that will have to be decided by Republicans? Right. It's, it's, I don't see Democrats getting involved in the budget discussions or getting a seat at the table, if you will. And there are two reasons for that. One is that last year's circumstances were clearly unique. Uh, we have a big fight over Medicaid expansion. The governor clearly wanted that, and so she cobbled together this coalition that we saw last year. And to, it's, a, it's an election year. And I don't, it's hard for me to see Republicans who are facing primary challenges uh, approving a budget that, is, uh, you know, that has this, the backing of a yeah. couple of Republicans and then Democrats. Any support of any Democrat for a, in a Republican primary would probably be poisoned there. But before we leave, speaking of Democrats, I mean, they're watching their, their counterparts here having all sorts of trouble, and now they're having it. some sort of leadership coup attempt here. What's going on? Right. There was a, one of the senators, well, Democratic senators, wanted to clear the air, if you will. There were some rumors that maybe he would vote for uh, the Senate's Republican budget. He wanted to say that that's not true, and then it turned out into this 
uh, it spiraled into you know the, what we saw yesterday, which is an attempt to remove the leaders, the democratic leaders, and, and replace. Of course, that near coup, non-existent coup, almost coup, that actually failed. Uh, but it just goes to show you that the uh, the troubles that we saw when they ousted uh, their previous leader, Leah Landrum Dale, last year, some of those yeah. troubles remain. This is really a divided caucus. So basically what you got down there at the Capitol, a bunch of Republicans can't figure out the budget, a bunch of Democrats can't figure out leadership, and everyone's kind of sitting around waiting for someone else to blink. As Bruce Wheeler said today, they've lost their minds. <laughs> All right. Uh, Luigi, we will stop it right there. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. The U.S. Supreme Court today issued a major ruling on money in politics. The high court removed limits on the total amount of money an individual donor can give to an overall number of campaigns in an election cycle. The court did not change dollar limits to particular candidates. Here to explain is Dan Barr, a partner in the law firm of Perkins Coie. It's good to see you again. Uh, it's, uh, we needed you here to make sense of this. Um, what <laughs> well, is, I don't know if I can do that. Well, you, you, you will. I know you. Supreme Court, what did the court rule today? What the court did today is strike down the aggregate campaign limits. There are two types of uh, campaign contribution limits. There are the individual limits, and the individual limits are you can give up to uh, $2,600 uh, per candidate per election. And then there's an aggregate limit. And the aggregate limit you could give up to $48,600 for all federal candidates in any particular election. So that base limit, I'm still limited in terms of giving to an individual campaign committee or a candidate. Correct. But the difference is uh, before today, you could only give the maximum amount to nine federal candidates. Uh, if you wanted to give to more than nine federal candidates, you couldn't give the maximum amount to at least, you know, any amount over nine. Um, so the difference now is that uh, the maximum amount that you could give before today uh, to um, as many candidates you, you wanted was $123,000. Okay. Uh, now you can give uh, the maximum amount to all the people running for the House and all the people running for the Senate, and that's $3.5 million. So basically, if my last name happens to be Koch, for example, and I have all this money, I can now spread this money out to as many. Obviously, each one is limited, but the overall number is, is limited you can only give, by that. You can give to as many federal candidates as you want, and uh, as a result, you can give it 28 times as much money yeah. after today's ruling than you could before. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts wrote that this, uh, the old limits were restricting First Amendment rights. What did he mean by that? Well, he said you have a First Amendment right to give to as many candidates as you want to give. He said restricting the amount of people that you can give money to uh, is like restricting a newspaper for how many people they can endorse for political office. And the, he says the First Amendment gives you the right to donate uh, money to however many people you want. If you want to donate to 12 federal candidates and you want to give them the maximum amount, you should be able to do that. And it sounds as though the high court was also saying we are concerned about corruption. We are concerned about the appearance of corruption. That's why those base levels remain. Yes, but uh, how you define corruption is the nub of the issue. Justice Roberts defines corruption as quid pro quo, this for that, the sort of traditional, you know, 
you know, I'll give you uh, uh, $2,000 and you know, you'll give me something back in return. You'll go light on regulating my company or doing whatever. That's quid pro quo corruption. Uh, what Justice Breyer, who wrote the dissent, said, no, we're concerned with something more than that. We're concerned with more of the appearance of corruption and the, the, the problem that money gives you preferred access. If you're able to give uh, to everybody who's running for Congress, your phone call is going to get returned quicker than somebody who gives like $100 to some candidate. And what Justice Breyer was concerned about and what the cases were concerned about before today are the rights of uh, the people who can't give that much money who get drowned out in the political process by people who have a lot of money and can control the message. Indeed. And so, so basically what, what it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong here, the court is equating spending money with free speech. A. B. What about those who don't have the money? Well, as with a lot of things, how you ask the question determines the answer. And the way Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts asked the question is, is uh, looking at the First Amendment rights of individuals to give as much, uh, to give as many candidates as they can. And he's looking at the individual First Amendment right. Uh, Justice Breyer is looking at the rights, the, sort of the collective rights of people who don't have access to a lot of money and don't have access to political system, not to have their message drowned out by people who do have a lot of money. So Justice Breyer is looking at the First Amendment rights of individuals. Justice, or, I'm sorry, Justice, uh, 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 the Chief Justice, yeah. Chief Justice Roberts is looking at the rights of individuals. And Justice Breyer and the four dissenters are looking at the collective rights of people who don't have money and don't have access to the political system. So when critics say the wealthy now will just have that much more influence on elections, do they have a point? Well, that's certainly one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is it, it might not make all that much difference. They're already giving a lot of money through independent expenditures, and maybe this way they'll be able to give money directly to these candidates instead of giving it to some IE that is then going to give the money to the candidate anyway. That's a great point because I was going to bring that up because I saw it argued somewhere that this could actually counter the influence of super PACs and other ways that money uh, is into this, gets into the system. One of the things that's been argued, and it's a, a political matter, and we'll see how it shakes out, is that this decision gives, uh, say, the Republican Party more control over, like, the Club for Growth and other independent expenditure groups and maybe even Tea Party groups and stuff because they'll be able to funnel more of the money to the party because you won't have this, uh, this cap on uh, contributions. Uh, that can be given by people, uh, but we'll see. Um, you know, I mean, we'll see how it plays out. But that was one of the arguments: is that uh, the Republican Party and the or the parties in general would have more control now over the independent expenditure groups. So, can we say one headline from all this is that free speech trumps political corruption? <laughs> well, we'll see. Uh, I mean, it's again, again, how you define it. If you define political corruption as, you know, Charlie Keating, for instance, having access to all these people because he's donating a lot of money to them, even though it's not quid pro quo corruption, then you should be concerned about this opinion. If you're not concerned about that and you think that someone like Charlie Keating should be have, have the right to give as much to give as, uh, to as many candidates as possible, then it's perfectly okay. Last question, were you surprised at all by the decision? No, um, since Justice Alito uh, replaced Sandra Day O'Connor on the Supreme Court, all five conservative justices have voted uh, to strike down every campaign contribution, every campaign expenditure limit that's come before the court. I lied. This is my last question. Um, <laughs> Citizens United, obviously a landmark decision. Does this come close to Citizens United? I don't think so, but it picks up from Citizens United, you know, the strain that, that money is speech, uh, and uh, it, it picks up the strain of, uh, of knocking down uh, McCain-Feingold and other campaign uh, finance restrictions. I think there's little doubt that with the current makeup of the court, that the individual uh, contribution limitations will soon fall as well. Wow. All right. Uh, good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me.
Charles Keating Jr. exemplified how money could influence politics. Keating admittedly hoped that his political campaign contributions would result in favorable treatment from elected officials. Keating built a financial empire that eventually collapsed, leaving many retirees with worthless investments and costing taxpayers billions of dollars. Michael Manning was the lead counsel for the FDIC in prosecuting Keating for wire and bankruptcy fraud and, and goodness knows what else here. Manning joins us to look back on the life of Charles Keating. It is very good to have you here. Thank you for good being be here. here with us. Uh, who was Charles Keating? He was an interesting and complex guy. He was a, a lawyer from Ohio uh, who moved uh, out here, bought American Continental and, and Lincoln Savings. Lincoln Savings only operated in Southern California, but the, the headquarters was here in Phoenix. So he bought it in about 84, and shortly thereafter, Congress deregulated SNL so that they could make investments, risky investments, and Charlie took that as a license to really go crazy, and he did. And we should mention American Continental became a major home builder here in the area. It, it was. My Huge. sister. Huge. Yeah. And, and Dobson Ranch and other developments, right. these were Keating developments. You know, the guy was a brilliant and charismatic man. Uh, no one can ever take that away from him. And had he stayed straight and just played by the rules that everybody else played with, even bent them a little bit, but not broken them, he would have been one of our state's leading and most, most uh, well-respected uh, businessmen. Well, before we go further, I want to go on that line there. What, why then did he decide to take the decisions that he went? Well, he, he, uh, he was, unfortunately, he was really affected by the Michael Milken era of excess. Uh, he went to the Predators Ball. He, he wanted to be like Mike. Um, so the conspicuous consumption of Lincoln Continental and Charlie Keating really drove him to do deals that, that he shouldn't be doing. So uh, back to the, uh, the original formula here. How did the success with, with Continental and the initial success with Lincoln, how did that lead to this vast empire with Lincoln? Well, he, he, he moved away from his successful home building uh, development uh, enterprise and started doing these risky uh, investments, and, and then he started doing them illegally, backdating documents, uh, 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 providing loans to, to people without appropriate credit checks. Um, so he took the money, and, and it wasn't just investor money, it was also our money, mm -hmm. it was tax dollars, and uh, really spewed that for around in, in very high-risk uh, investments. What were the first signs that Lincoln wasn't on the up and up? Well, very, the first signs were not evident to the regulators until about 88 because Charlie hired the best lawyers he could find and the best accountants, paid them by return mail premium fees, and they helped him cover up what was going on. So it really wasn't evident to the, to the regulators until 1988. And what made it evident? Well, they started finding irregularities in documents that just didn't make sense. Um, and that's when uh, ultimately it closed uh, uh, 25 years ago this month. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and the investigation then ensued and more and more was discovered. That's when we were brought in. And so how did Lincoln eventually fail? Well, uh, Lincoln ultimately was, the investors came in, and I'm sorry, the bank uh, examiners came in in 1988 and discovered that Lincoln had created a black hole of about $3.4 billion in, in, in losses. So once that was discovered, uh, the, the, the litigation ensued. And so we got we costing taxpayers $3.4 billion and costing these investors, and many of these investors retirees. Talk to us about that because that's the heartbreaking aspect of this story. It is the heartbreaking aspect, and here's what would happen. Uh, most of them were in Southern California. Most of them had uh, federally insured CDs, and they would trundle up to the window and say, I'd like to renew my CD. It's federally insured. What's the what's what percentage are you paying? We're paying 3.8 percent, but we'll pay you 4.5 percent if you buy a Lincoln Savings bond, and it's safer than federally insured. And those those tellers and people selling it knew better, knew that they were junk bonds, and people lost their entire their entire savings, mostly retirees. And yet we hear that uh, Charlie Keating never had any regrets, never made any apologies. Uh, how? Explain that to me. Well, as I said at the opening of, of the interview, he was a very complex man. Uh, 
not complex in all positive ways. Um, he had a view of himself and of Lincoln Savings that he had a right to, to, to do this. He was the head of Lincoln, actually he wasn't legally the head of Lincoln Savings. He was, he, he on purpose didn't take a, a, a official role, but he, he, he puppet stringed everybody else. So he felt he had a right to, to, uh, uh, to raise this money in this way, a right to make these investments and that the regulators were, were wrong in criticizing what he was doing. Did he say that the regulators were wrong in the sense that they were criticizing or that they were wrong in the sense that they were emphasizing rules and laws that he, what, he thought just shouldn't exist? He completely disagreed with that. There was what was known as the direct investment rule that he wanted promulgated and passed so that they could make more direct investments. He just took the position that the regulator's view of safety and soundness in banking was wrong. He knew what was best for Lincoln Savings, and he ought to be allowed to pursue all of the, the investments and loans that he wanted to pursue. And at one point, he managed to get some members of Congress uh, to go to these regulators and intervene on his behalf. Tell us about the Keating Five. Well, we, we, we became uh, very much involved in the Keating Five uh, issues early on in, in the investigation and the litigation that we did. Um, and uh, Senator Cranston probably was the, the, the most culpable of, of the group. He was from California. Glenn, Ohio, Regal, Michigan, and then, of course, Deacon Cini and McCain here. Uh, you know, McCain uh, was probably the least culpable of that entire group. I don't think he knew what was going on, and there's an important story about that, and that is when, when the regulators came to him and said, uh, Senator, we think we've discovered some potential fraud backdating documents, he said, I'm out. Yeah. And he got out and, and, and really upset Keating. But the money act, the money that, uh, that Keating uh, managed to contribute to politicians was, again, money from public coffers. It wasn't Keating money. It was money from public coffers. And I remember during the time when the Phoenician was up and big, and he w th there were stories about how secretaries answering the phone were getting paid $100,000 yes. a year. And everyone was like, how glorious, how wonderful, until we all realized that that's our money. It was our money. And here's what would happen. And, and you know the story about Mother Teresa. Yes. And I'm well, tell very quickly, quickly. Okay. Tell uh, us. Very quickly. Um, Charlie would loan, and someone would come and say, I want to borrow $30 million in this project in Tucson to build it. He said, I'm not going to lend you 30, I'm going to lend you 32 million, but you're going to need to contribute $2 million back to me for politicians and causes that I favor. Who, you obviously had a chance to deal with him uh, on a variety of levels. To you, who was Charlie? We asked who Charlie Keating was, but who was Charlie Keating to you? How did he shape how you see people, how you do your job? Well, it was a very tough piece of litigation because he always hired the most expensive, uh, very qualified lawyers and accountants, uh, and as I said, paid them by return mail. It was, a, it was a good client for some of these people to have until things turned turn ugly. So to me, he, was, he, he really uh, was emblematic of the, of the culture of, of that period of time of the fast run and gun uh, savings and loan uh, entrepreneurs. And with that in mind, is would he be a character of this time as well, or is he just another face in the crowd considering the current climate? He would be a character in this era as well. Yeah. He would, uh, uh, he would be a, a Wall Street uh, uh, um, character for sure. Well, Michael, we thought of you uh, immediately when we heard mm -hmm. the story of a Charlie Keating passing. Thank you so much for the information. It's good to have you. Thanks for joining us. Good to be us. here. And Thursday on Arizona Horizon, a special non-Friday edition of the Journalists' Roundtable. We'll have the latest on the budget standoff at the Capitol, and we'll discuss Phoenix losing out on hosting the 2016 Republican National Convention. That's on a special Thursday night edition of the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.